Good evening, everybody. Um, here we are on Tuesday night. Saw you last night, and I hope that you have uh, tuned back in here tonight to, to really see something I think is so pertinent to uh, what we're facing, what's going on. Um, you know, when, you, when you're uh, facing the kind of uh, things that we're having to face right now as a family, it, it kind of changes the dynamics of how you go about your everyday life. And uh, sometimes the pressure can mount and build. And before you know it, it gets kind of personal. And the tension gets <laughs> really tight. We forget who our enemy is. And uh, all of a sudden, flesh and blood comes into play when we really ought to be focusing in on the Lord and letting him fight our battles for us. We start battling with each other. And some of that just kind of translates over to a battle in the home. And uh, I've been real sensitive about that. I've been reading a lot of uh, articles and I've been listening to a lot of people as they've told me about uh, how they have been thrust into an arena that they have never been a part of before. And they're having to navigate it and having to deal with it. And I thought, well, as a pastor, I really need to probably address some of this. And I, I, didn't, I couldn't come up with anyone better uh, than Dr. Charles Lowry. Uh, well-known, nationally known psychologist among Southern Baptists for many, many, many years. And he has a powerful message uh, to families and to marriages that I am glad that you're here to hear. And so uh, tune in here in just a minute as Dr. Lowry comes. And then don't forget about Thursday night. Uh, Matthew's put together a tremendous inspirational evening uh, and uh, you'll like it. It's that old Bill Gaither style of homecoming, and uh, we've got greater vision uh, that is going to be kind of heading that up, and uh, you'll be blessed by that. Uh, Gerald Wolf is, is a powerful personality and got a powerful testimony, uh, got a great heartbeat for leading people in worship, so that's uh, Thursday night at 7 o'clock. So we're doing our best to stay in touch, doing our best uh, to connect with you uh, through uh, the internet and uh, when we can't gather here. But, uh, you know, we heard today that things are going to loosen up a little bit and we're already making plans. Matter of fact, got a meeting in the morning and uh, we're going to be talking about some more creative ways that maybe we could get together and to worship. So uh, stay tuned. We'll, we'll get more into that. Okay, let's cut away now and uh, go directly to... Uh, Charles Lowry, uh, forgive uh, the uh, quality of the video. It's, uh, it's, it was birthed up in the mountains on an iPhone. So uh, it's as good as we can get for the time. Uh, so God bless you and I pray. Let me hear back from you, by the way. Let me hear back uh, how God may have spoken to you through this, okay? Enjoy. God bless. First of all, I want to thank Mike Whitson for the opportunity to be in your home and talk to you about relationships. Uh, I love your church, Indian Trail, First Baptist Indian Trail. <laughs> I've been there, and uh, you got a great church. And uh, just thank you so much for this opportunity. I am a psychologist by training, and so we're going to help you during this difficult time. We're under a lot of stress, under a lot of difficulty, and so relationships, that's what suffers. So I want to give you some help, some hopefully some very practical help, to teach you how to get along through this process and actually have great relationships and use it as a time where relationships get better because we've got time to work on those things that matter the most. Relationships do matter. Matter of fact, I've worked with thousands of people. I've worked with Dallas Cowboys, billionaires. I, I've, it, it doesn't matter where you are in terms of success, money, houses. You can have three or four houses. You can, uh, yeah. None of that matters. If you're, relation, if you're not happy in your relationships, you're not happy. And so we're going to talk about relationships. So I want to teach you some things, and so I want you to think specifically what you can do differently. Here's what happens many times. Uh, you hear a general sermon about general things, and in general, you generally decide you're generally going to do generally better than what you generally did before you generally heard the message. But generally, you don't do anything any different. And then you say, well, what happened? Well, you wasted your time. So I don't want you to waste your time today. You have to get specific in order to get terrific. You have to decide, I'm going to do something different in order for your life to change. So we're going to get specific about some things you can do to make your relationships matter. First of all, let me tell you what behavioral cues are. 
They're things that control your behavior. Most of what you do is just habit. It's unconscious, you don't even think about it, and you have these unconscious habits that you do, and the only way to change is to break into that unconscious habit. So a behavioral cue is something that reminds you that I'm actually going to do something different. So I'm going to give you a behavioral cue to think about. Now, some of you think this is going to be pretty dorky, but, hey, I'm your shrink for the day, and let's just play along with me. I want you to take your uh, breathing, and I want you to breathe in as, as much as you can. In other words, just take that breath and just breathe it all in, and, and just keep breathing it in. I mean, watch me do this. And breathe in even more so you actually feel it in your stomach. And when you're doing that, I want you to think this thought, my way. Life living my way. You're bringing it in. You know, bring it into you. Uh, and you're going to make this thing work. Now, feel all that stress. And then hold that about five or six seconds. And then let it out. Uh, breathe it in through your nose. Let it out through your stomach and, and through your mouth as it comes out that all of your body. And then I want you to think this thought. God's way. There's two ways to live life. Especially in the area of relationships. There's your way, which your Adam suit wants what you want. You want to be selfish. You want to get your needs met. And then there's God's way. That says there's another way to look at this. By serving other people, by loving people the way I've loved you. And God's way works in the long term. Now, your way sometimes works in the short term. Uh, and, and that's why you do it. But in the long term, God says, my way works the best. So let me give you another little therapy. This is a little free therapy here. I want you to put your hand over your heart. And I want you to repeat after me. I'm going to lead you in a little pledge. And so you've got to repeat it or it won't, it won't work. Look at me and say this. I of sound mind do hereby acknowledge that I have never, nor have I ever, controlled the universe. Therefore, I resign as general manager of the universe. You see, God's world is the world you're in. It's not your world. And God says no matter what happens in the short term, because of the cross, the cross is the biggest plus sign in your life. The cross is the worst thing that anybody can do to somebody. God made it the best for everybody. If he can do that with a cross, no matter what happens in your relationships, in the long term, God can take that and use it for his glory and for your good. And so we have to understand that. So you're going to do that little technique. I would do it in the morning. Matter of fact, I would do it tomorrow. Because the quicker you start something, the better chance you have of following through. If you wait a couple of days, you won't do it. It's just, it's just science. You just won't do it. So you have to start as quickly as you hear it. Then I would tell somebody you're doing it. And you know, the first thing you do in the morning, uh, most of you probably go to the bathroom, uh, and then you maybe brush your teeth. But there's one thing that you think, when I do this, then I'm going to breathe in, and I'm going to feel all that tension of living life my way. All that stress. And then I'm going to exhale all that stress, and I'm going to say, today, I'm doing it God's way. I'm going to do it God's way. My way, all kind of stress. God's way, all kind of relaxation. So how do we put that into practice with relationships? Well, here's God's way. There's a little code to live a great life. God says there's two homes in the Bible. One was built on the rock, one was built on the sand. And when the storm comes... The one on the rock stands, the one on the sand does not stand. So how do you build your house, your home, on the rock? Well, God says you do it according to his code, and his code is love. Matter of fact, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it puts it this way. It says this, even when people do evil against you, you don't do evil back. Even when they revile against you, you don't revile back. Now, uh, even your home family, probably during this time, as you thought they'd done a little evil toward me. Or they've definitely reviled against me. And it says, you, you don't revile back. What do you do? Here's what the Bible says. You bless them. Matter of fact, it says you were called to do this. This is why you're here. To bless. To love others the way you've been loved. You bless them. For this you were called. And then God says that you may obtain a blessing. This is, God says this is the code. This is the way it works. You bless people. I bless you. I've loved you first for you to love other people. That's God's code. So how do you put it into practice? Well, let's take that word love. L-O-V-E. L stands for learn. You have to learn how to love people. Everybody is loved in a different way. How do you know God loves you? The only way you know is God left his world and entered your world. That's the only way you know God. The only way 
people know you love them as you're willing to leave your world and enter their world. Whether that's your kid, whether that's your mate, it doesn't matter. Uh, their world is totally different from your world. And loving you and loving them are two different things. You, you want to be loved in a different way than, than they want to be loved. And so you have to learn how to do that. Well, how do you do that? Well, the most important way is just by listening. You have to listen. Now, I know for you men, this is a little, a little tougher uh, because we don't, we're, we don't communicate as well as women do. So we have to work a little extra hard at that. But I'm going to give you some help here in communication. Now, let me give you the number one problem you have with communication. It's this. You wait too late to communicate. You wait too late to communicate. You wait until the stress comes up, doing it your way, and then bad things happen. Let me give you some few illustrations of that. Let's just say you uh, go to your garage, and it's been a long winter, and uh, the garage is in a mess. Things have just been piled up. You've been sticking stuff in there. And it's just a mess, right? It's a mess. And you look around and you see your golf clubs. And you say, boy, I haven't been a long winter. I haven't played golf all winter. Man, and I know that Saturday is going to be a beautiful day. I'm going to play golf. Call my buddies to you off about 10 o'clock. Man, that's good. it's going to be great. You can see it in your mind. You out there with your buddies. You bring a smile on your face. And then a few minutes later, your wife comes in to the garage, and she looks around, and she said, this is a mess. Man, this is, well, all winter we've just been sticking stuff in here. It, it's just out of control. But I know Saturday is going to be a beautiful day. What a great day for a family work day. Clean this garage up. Start about 10 o'clock. Now, let me teach you a word. The word is psychological. But well, we're going to break it up into two words, psycho and logical, right? So let me just give you how it happens. If on Saturday you haven't spoken another word about what's inside you about playing golf, and she hasn't spoken a word about what's inside her about cleaning that garage, when you get out those golf clubs at 10 o'clock on Saturday, the word is going to be psycho. That's just the way it's going to be. Why? Because all that adrenaline, all that, all that expectation is there. And so you come out emotionally, and it gets loud, and it gets bad. It gets psycho. Now, it could be logical if you don't wait too late to communicate. For example, if they, on Tuesday, the wife and the husband, if they started talking about that. And he said, you know, I'm planning on playing golf on Saturday. And she said, uh, no, I, I, I'm planning on us having a work day and cleaning this garage out. They might have been able to come up with a solution. He might have said something like this. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I'll call and I think I can get an earlier tea time. We'll tee off about 7.30 and we'll be home by 12 and, and I'll uh, 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 tell everybody 1 o'clock we are going to hit it. Man, we're going to work hard and we're going to just work like Trojans. We'll, we'll, this, this place will be spotless by 4.30, 5 o'clock and then I'll take everybody to dinner to celebrate that we got the garage. It could be logical, but you have to not wait too late. Had this couple in Dallas. Uh, they came to see me when I was in practice, and uh, they uh, having difficulties, even talking about divorce. And so uh, when I do marriage counseling, I separate people, so I saw the wife first, and I asked, what are your expectations? I want it to be logical, not psycho. You know, uh, before what happened, what are your expectations about this relationship? What, what's going wrong here? And here's what she said. We have a pretty good relationship, but she, she had these, I have three preschool kids, and, and they are just exhausting. And I am so exhausted that every day when my husband comes home from work, I think he's going to help me. And so the kids rush to the door. Matter of fact, there was a big window where she could see the car come by, and she would say, Daddy's home, and they would race to the door. And you know what preschool kids carry around, I won't go into it, but it, it was just bad. I mean, they would just get stuff on him and all kind of stuff, and he would get mad. And so she said, I can't understand why he wouldn't want to help me. Well, I said, okay, your expectations are to help you with these kids. So she leaves and the husband come in. And I'm wondering, why would he get so mad? You know, his kid jumping on him. And so 
he told me, he says, I work at a commercial real estate place. And uh, he was in commercial real estate in Dallas, which at the time they were making tons of money. It was like Monopoly. They were just going around and collecting money. Uh, it became like Monopoly in the end, too. They got the go-to-jail card. But at this point in time, he was making lots of money. And he told me about his suits. He wore Italian handmade suits with real people's names in them. I mean, $5,000 suits. This is in the 1980s. $5,000 suits. Handmade in Italy. Well, when he would come home from work, these kids would jump on him with what preschool kids carry around, and he would get stuck on his suit, and he'd get mad at him. He'd throw one away, and the other one would jump on him, get mad, and, and it was just, it was cycle. Every afternoon, cycle. So I asked him, what are your expectations when you come home from work? He said, I know she needs help with these kids. And that's when he explained to me about his suit and how they get on it. He said, if they would just, she would give me 15 minutes, not announce that I'm coming, so I could sneak in the back door, take off my nice suit, get on something like a rubber suit I could hose down. I would love to help her with these kids. I said, well, have you ever told her that? He said, no, but we just fight about it. It was psycho. I said, okay, I'm going to bring her back in, and we're going to make this logical. I want you to share your expectations and see what she says. So she comes back in, and he goes through the whole story. His Italian suits, you know, if you just give me 15 minutes, don't announce that I'm coming, so I can get on a rubber suit, something I can hose down. I would love to help you with these kids. She smiles back at him, and she says, if I know you're going to help me, I'll give you 30 minutes. If I can see the light at the end of the tunnel, I'll give you 30 minutes. Uh, they both smile. They, we, it, it was logical. Uh, you see, you got two choices. You can do it your way, you let it all build up, or you can let it out, and you can let God's way. You have to learn to listen, though, in order to learn how to love people. O stands for overlook. Most of your stress, especially when you're close quarters and, re and, and relationships are right now, can be solved by one little word, overlook. Most people get so upset about things that do not matter. One lady, uh, she uh, uh, had to go to work. Teenage boy stayed home that day, and she just asked him if he could put the clothes in the dryer. So she goes to work, comes back home. He forgets to put the clothes in the dryer. She goes psycho. I, I mean, you know, some mothers can actually put their mouth in gear and go off and leave it. I mean, she just started to go on and on. Can't you do anything? Can't you do this? Can't you do that? I mean, on and on. And finally, she interrupted her. Said, Mom, can I ask you a question? She said, what? Said, when you're up at the church talking to your friends, they say, my daughter's on drugs, and we don't know what we're going to do, or my son's become an alcoholic, or my son's in prison, or my daughter's pregnant, and we don't know what we're going to do. Do you say, that's nothing. My son forgets to put the clothes in the dryer. And at that point, she said, I realized I go a little overboard. I get a little upset over things that do not matter. I had a lady come to me. We talked for a while, and I realized what the problem was. She and her husband had been shopping and ran across a big sale. She bought five no-iron shirts, is how she described them. And the shirts were meant for him to wear to work every day. So had different color shirts, five shirts at one time. Bought them on sale, incredible price. Monday morning, he didn't put his shirt on. She looked at him and said, why aren't you wearing your new shirt? He said, because because it's not ironed. She said, well, of course it's not ironed. It's a no iron shirt. He said, yeah, but I like my shirts ironed. It says no iron, but I want them ironed. She says, I'm not ironing a no iron shirt. Well, you know how that goes. It, it, it goes cycle. You know, uh, they start to get louder and louder. And finally, he's not wearing that shirt unless it's ironed. And she's not ironing the shirt. So she comes to see the psychologist. Well, after a while, I realized what the problem is. Problem is, uh, five no iron shirts. 
So I said, I got an answer to your problem. I said, you had an appointment next week. She said, at 9 o'clock on Wednesday. I said, good. When you come in, you bring those five no-iron shirts. I'll look on the calendar, and I'll know uh, what day you're coming in, and uh, I'll bring an iron and an ironing board. So when you get here, you bring those shirts back to me, and then you can go in the lobby, drink a Diet Coke, read the magazine, just relax. Uh, I will iron the five no-iron shirts. And after about 15 minutes, take about three minutes a shirt, they will be ironed. So you will have no-iron shirts that are now ironed. I will have 35 minutes on a psychologist hour because there's only 35 minutes to start. I mean, you get left. So I got 35 minutes. It's only 50 minutes a psychologist hour. So I got 15 minutes to relax. Uh, more than that. So, hey, I'm happy. I tell her, you're happy. You got, you got the five no iron shirts. You take them to your husband who now has the five no iron shirts. Now iron, he's happy. Everybody is happy. She looked at me and says, you're an idiot. She said, you think I'm going to pay you all this money to iron these shirts? She said, I'm going to go home and iron them myself. And I said, sounds like a good idea to me. Matter of fact, I have a whole sermon on uh, overlooking. I preached it in Arkansas. There was a man standing at the back of the line there. And I don't know, I thought at first he was just wanting to sign a book. But I could tell he, he was fidgeting a little bit. He had a question. I got, he got to the front of the line, and he said, uh, that message was for me. He said, I have that intense personality. He said, when my wife and I first got married, he said, uh, every time I would go to the bathroom, there would be no toilet tissue, just that cardboard cylinder staring me in the face. So I just got more and more upset with that. I would say to her, why can't you change the toilet tissue? She acted like it was no big deal. She said, I change it as much as you do. He said, it was a big deal to me. He said, from then on, I started taking those cardboard cylinders off and writing the date and time when I had those cardboard cylinders. And I started saving them in a black plastic bag. He said, I did that for a couple of months, waiting for toilet tissue to come up in the conversation. And one day it did. One day we started talking, and she said to me, I change it as much as you do. He said, I started screaming at my sweet wife. No, you do not. I have proof. He said he ran and got his black plastic bag, started dumping those cardboard cylinders all over the place, screaming at his wife. There's a date and time I got proof. He said she was shocked. She looked at all those cardboard cylinders bouncing everywhere, picked up one and saw the date and time. And looked at me and said, you're sick. He said, I'll tell you who's sick. We're going to go see the psychiatrist. He said, he made a four o'clock appointment. He went in there with his cardboard cylinders and a big black plastic bag. that looked like Santa Claus. Dumped them all over the psychiatrist's desk and said, here's the problem. I got to leave this. Never change a toilet tissue as long as I, and I got proof. He said, I started screaming at him. He said, he looked at me and said, you're sick. I carry around these, uh, cardboard cylinders. <laughs> uh, the reason is I'm, I'm sick. Uh, another reason I care around is because uh, you're sick. You see, we all have within us the capability to get downright angry over things that we can take care of ourselves. That in the big scheme of life does not matter. Matter of fact, I was uh, preaching at one of those high, high church, uppity high church places back east. And I thought it'd be a good time to tell the toilet tissue story. So I was telling that toilet tissue story, and I could tell the pastor was not liking it. He was in those uppity seats, you know, behind the pulpit back there, you know how those high churches are. And he was sitting there, and uh, I was getting a little, you know, I could tell he's not liking this toilet tissue story. So I went back to stand beside him. And so I just thought, well, I just take it to the next level, I handed him my toilet tissue uh, right in front of a packed out house. And he grabbed that and slammed it into his pocket. And I was thinking, he's not liking a toilet tissue story. And so we had to leave. We had to go out of these steps to go downstairs. He closed the door and he turned to me and all the, all the blood started draining out of his face. He started to uh, kind of smile just a little bit. And he said, I could, said, you could probably tell I was a little upset on the platform. I, said, well, you know, it doesn't take a psychologist to spot those veins popping out. 
And I said, I could seem like you were. He said, well, you won't believe what happened to me this afternoon. He said, my wife and I have been married 32 years. We got in the biggest fight we've ever been in this afternoon, about an hour before church. It was over toilet tissue. I thought she called you and told you about it. When you've been doing this as long as I have, you realize people fight over things that do not matter. Let me get personal. You fight over things that do not matter. Think about it this way. God, because of Jesus Christ, has chosen to overlook everything you've ever done or will do. All he asks is you overlook the things in other people's lives. Learn to overlook. You'll be amazed how much stress that takes out of your life. V stands for value. Value is gratitude. Value means that you appreciate what you have. Your Adam suit, your earth suit, it, it, it wants, it's selfish. It, it wants what everybody else has. We, we come from the Adams family. Remember Uncle Adam and A.D.? They had everything, everything. God gave them everything except one thing. And that's what they ended up wanting, just that one thing. You see, as a rule, man the food. When it's hot, you want it cool. When it's cool, you want it hot. Always wanting what's not. As a rule, man the food. And of course, it's worse now with the information highway. You see people's highlights on Facebook, and you start comparing your heartaches with people's highlights. See, it's not as good as they show you on Facebook. It's not as bad as it sounds on Twitter either. But it's they, they, they're showing you their, in a sense, their fantasy day, their, their best day. And here's what happens. We start comparing our insides with other people's outsides. We start comparing our facts with fantasy. Back when I was in private practice, I'd have these guys, they would come in and say, oh, Dr. Lowry, I'm falling in love with my secretary. She uh, dresses better than my wife. She, uh, she's always in a good mood. Uh, she listens to me. And I said, well, I got an answer for that. You pay your wife and let her off at four o'clock. She'll be in a fantastic mood. You see, he's starting to compare fact with fantasy. These ladies would say, oh, Dr. Lowry, my husband just listen the way you would listen. If he'd be compassionate the way you, if you just look at my eyes when I talk the way you look into my eyes, and I'd say, well, pay him $150 an hour like you paid me. He'll, he'll look in your eyes when you talk. You see, my friend, you only have two choices in life, only two. You can tear up that fantasy that does not exist. And you can accept your mate, your kids, your church as a gift of God. Or else you'll spend the rest of your life tearing up those people, trying to make them look like a fantasy that does not exist. And you'll be a very miserable person. Accept what you have. Appreciate what God's given you. Grateful people become great people ungrateful people become hateful people and destroy everything around them. Listen. Learn from your listening. Overlook. Learn to value what you have. And E stands for two things. First of all, something very practical, and that is exercise. You've been cooped up. You're doing lots of things there but you have to exercise. Matter of fact, every study on depression shows that exercise is the magic bullet. And you say, well, the Bible didn't talk a lot about exercise. Well, the reason is because they walked everywhere they went in biblical times. They, they got exercise. Uh, exercise you need to do. It, it needs to be part of your process of living. It will give you energy. It will help you live a great life. Learn have some method that you're going to exercise. So let me give you something really practical. Learn to take walks with your mate. Men, remember, have difficulty communicating. We didn't grow up cooperating. We grew up with competition. We grew up king of the hill, capture the flag, put a helmet on, seriously injure the other guy. That's how we grew up. When you say let's talk to a man, that's like I'm on leprosy or a root canal. You know, it, that makes him nervous. That makes him stressed out. Men need to have an activity in order to communicate. It helps reduce the stress in them. 
So learn to take walks together. You see, that's a legitimate fidget for a man. It, it helps reduce that stress. And by the way, you have a better chance of agreeing. When you walk in the same direction, watch people disagree. They'll stop and turn toward each other because the mind and the body are connected. So walk in the same direction, get some exercise, and then the man will start to relax, and he will start to, to me, communicate with you. So exercise, very important. E also stands for encouragement. People flock to be around Jesus, even the worst sinners. Why? He was the greatest encourager who ever lived. Remember the story, even a lady caught in the very act of adultery? Here's what Jesus said. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I think that life, the life of that lady totally changed. Why? Because somebody encouraged her. Somebody believed, somebody believed there was a better life for her. Learned we all need encouragement. We, we all need it. Hey, you ever, remember when your uh, kids were young and you put them on that carousel at Six Flags or somewhere and you tried to go get a drink, and you have to wave every time they came around. Every day, and they're, no, I will get, no, they're, they're coming. You wave every time. Why? Because all of us want to be noticed. All of us want to be, that somebody cares about us. Learn to encourage. So what do we have? We have God's code. God's code means that you love others the way he loved you. That you decide, I'm going to bless others the way he blesses you. You see, you never know. Remember, God takes the far look. You, you never know what's happening right now, how God's going to take that and use that in the life of your family. You, you don't know the results. One guy heard, heard something like this, and he thought he'd take his uh, teenage boy fishing. They didn't have a really good relationship. And thought he'd take him fishing. In social distance right now, fishing, if you get out of the lake far enough, probably. Uh, and uh, his, his, the mom, the, the wife was all excited. Oh, they're going to go together, he and his son, taking fishing. So when he came back, she asked him, how'd it go? And son, of course, went to the room and he asked him, dad, and dad said, it wasn't good. You know, he, he was awful. As a matter of fact, it poured down rain. We, you know, those sandwiches you made as far as for a picnic out there, it poured, it, they were soggy. I mean, it just went through everything. I mean, it was, it was, said, and we, we didn't even, I don't think we got a bite, much less a fish. I mean, it, it was, it was just awful. Uh, and I said, oh, she said, oh no, that's, that's bad. And so, uh, then what happens, uh, she, of course, being a mom, is cleaning around the house and she goes into the son's room and there's his journal for English class and uh, he's she knew he was writing one that's kind of a project and uh, she knew she wasn't supposed to look at it it's private you know nobody's supposed to look at this and uh, but she's the mom so she picks it up and she starts looking at that day Saturday here's what it said Saturday best day of my life <laughs> dad and I went fishing we talked about everything. Remember, Dad said he didn't say a word. Yep, no, maybe, basically. No. We talked about everything. Wished we could do that every Saturday. You don't know what God's going to take and use in the life of your family when you decide to do it His way. Want to breathe in? Feel all that tension your way. Now let it out and say God's way. Never forget USA Today, picture on the front page. Hurricane Andrew came through, destroyed a whole neighborhood, every house demolished. One house standing right in the middle of that neighborhood, one house. He interviewed the guy that owned the house and said, man, you're the luckiest guy alive. He said, no, I'm not. He said, I moved to Florida, I'm an engineer. I did all the research. How do you build a house to withstand 150 mile an hour winds? So when it said, use concrete, I use concrete. He said, I built this house according to code that would withstand the worst storm. Never forget seeing that house in the middle of that neighborhood. Today, we've talked about God's code. Follow it. And no matter what else gets demolished, your house will stay. God bless.